Um, so good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our latest uh, Waterways webinar. And this one is Ellesmere Yard, Regenerating Waterways Heritage. I'm Michael Haig from Shrewsbury and North Wales branch, and I'll be your host for this evening's talk. We have a nice intimate little gathering here for our fireside chat this evening. Um, actually, we've had over 100 people registered for this talk. So um, obviously the yard, its past and its potential future um, is of great interest to uh, a lot of people all around the country. I think it's very appropriate that we're discussing the yard's future uh, at, this, at this moment. Not only have the Ellesmere team completed a lot of important preparatory work over the summer, uh, but it also coincides with a renewed focus on waterways heritage uh, by IWA. If you're an IWA member, I hope that by now you'll be familiar with our Save Waterways Heritage campaign and uh, our appeal for help uh, in uh, recording details of the hidden heritage of our waterways. Indeed, you'll probably have seen the um, appeal leaflet, which uh, arrived with the latest edition of our Waterways magazine. And I uh, hope you'll be able to support and uh, donate to this campaign. Ellesmere Yard obviously isn't hidden heritage, it's in, it's in plain view. Um, but the community skills and crafts that surround it are, are more easily overlooked. So I think its future should um, really uh, be of great interest to anyone who loves our canals and their history. But to talk about Ellesmere Yard this evening, we have three speakers who will address different aspects of the Yard's past, present and future. Nicola Lewis-Smith, Enterprise Manager with CRT West Midlands, will give us some context regarding the present situation with the yard. And then noted local historian Tony Lurie will talk about the yard's history. And Ruth Essex from Media and Arts Partnership will explain the work they're doing on behalf of CRT to explore a sustainable future for the yard. I'm sure you'll have questions for our panel after their presentations, and we'll deal with as many of these as possible at the end. Right, that's enough from me. So sit back, relax, enjoy the talk, and over to you, Nicola. Right, thank you very much. Let me um, attempt to share my screen with you. Oh, there, can you see that? Yeah, uh, that I think I have to say, I think that's the most nerve wracking aspect of this, trying to share my presentation. <laughs> so hopefully I've been able to tick that box. Um, so my name is Nicola Lewis-Smith. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Enterprise Manager for the West Midlands, as, as Michael said. Um, I'm part of the team that's looking at Ellesmere Yard and um, trying to find that sustainable end use for the yard. Um, as we move forward. Um, so we've been working really closely with Ruth and her colleagues from MAP in developing those sort of ideas for the site. So the idea of my presentation tonight is I'll just give you a little bit of context as to why we're looking at Ellesmere Yard. I'm not gonna go into a great deal of uh, depth in terms of the history, because that's why we have Tony here who knows it far more intimately than I do. And also, um, I'm just gonna give a little bit of a flavor of what we've been doing over the last 18 months because uh, Ruth will also be um, talking about that in a lot more detail, but hopefully it'll give you the idea uh, of, and the essence of what we're trying to achieve at the site within this presentation. So, Ellesmere Yard. Um, for those that don't know, it's on the Langotland Canal in North Shropshire. Um, it dates from around um, 1806 and the beach house was the headquarters of the Ellesmere Canal Company and the yard was its maintenance depot. It's really interesting that the yard has been in continued canal use since it was first built and it's a great example of a maintenance yard and it's owned by the Canal and River Trust. 
It's still actively used today. It's a base for our operational staff and um, for those teams that look after the Langotlan and the Montgomery canals. Um, it was, it's built on the most central point of the navigation. But in um, the 1920s, Beach House, which is the building to the left hand side of the photograph with the sort of round turret, um, was split into apartments. And in actual fact, Beach House doesn't form part of our project area. The buildings that you see to the right, which are the cluster that, of buildings that make up to the yard, and the field beyond that is the project area that we are looking at at the moment as we move forward. Um, earlier in this year, we commissioned a heritage assessment of the yard um, by uh, from Nigel Crow, who some people will be familiar with. And for me, Nigel really summed up what the absolute essence is of Ellesmere Yard. And I'm going to read this because I want to make sure I get it right. So Nigel wrote that Ellesmere Yard was a vanishingly rare example of a historic maintenance yard that was purpose built. It is a museum quality place where you can literally reach out and touch history. And for me, that's what sums up the yard. However, as our operational teams have reduced and many of the spaces within those buildings are no longer used, we now need to rethink about how we can repurpose this site so that it has a long-term sustainable use. This is a view of the yard from, interestingly, the photograph on the left-hand side is actually a photograph taken from the chimneys of Beach House looking into the yard. We had some works done to repair the roof some years ago at Beach House and the opportunity was taken to take those photographs. And you can see there what an interesting cluster of buildings we have. And on the right hand side is the view from the field looking back to the yard. So you can see that strong relationship we have with that side of the site um, back with the yard. So over the past 18 months, we've been working with MAP um, using the principles of slow architecture. And, and slow architecture is very much about being a considered approach. And it's about testing ideas and piloting ideas and finding solutions that are appropriate and sympathetic for that particular site, rather than writing a master plan and helicoptering it in, dropping it off and leaving it and then leaving everybody to get on with it and try and make it work. It's, it's much more, as I say, considered approach, which I think is wholly appropriate for Ellesmere Yard. So we've been working with Matt to engage and consult, consult on the potential for reusing the spaces and the adjacent land. And during that time, we've consulted with organizations such as Historic England, We've consulted closely with Shropshire Council, all the various different departments within Shropshire Council. We've also presented to the IWA Heritage Advisory Group. We've been engaging with the local town and rural councils amongst others. And we've also undertaken consultation within Ellesmere itself to try and understand and gauge what people feel about the yard. And, and the, the purpose of this work that we've been doing is to develop a plan of action and a sustainable business plan for those buildings and the adjacent land as we move forward. So what's the heritage significance? As I say, Tony will talk about this in a lot more detail than me. But from a Canal and River Trust point of view, it's one of our least altered canal yards dating from the early 1800s. It's of national importance, and that's reflected in the listing of the buildings. We have four two-star listed buildings and one grade, um, grade two um, listed building. And it's also part, a key part of the Ellesmere conservation area along with the canal itself. And the heritage significance relates to the, to actually to the group of buildings. That's what's really significant about this site. And the five themes of aesthetic, so it's very much how it was designed, the use of materials, 
it's functional but close attention to detail and that goes down to the quality of the stonework the windows door frames even the latches in the cupboards and then the evidential is is just really around the survival of the buildings and their fixtures and the historical it's obviously it's close association with thomas telford and the Ellesmere um, canal and also actually its relationship now with the Ponkasukta aqueduct and canal world heritage site Ellesmere is very important in telling that story um, of that world heritage site and for me I think probably the most interesting is the communal it's about the people it's about patterns of work past and present the fact that you can go into some of those spaces you can find the old documents you can find the staff lists you can find the bell and quite often people within that area have had relatives working within the yard so those stories are quite real and also the values which were became very evident in the heritage assessment that Nigel Crow undertook for us and is reflective in the um, the quote that I gave you at the beginning of the presentation. What I'm going to do now is just show you some of the sites that we have within the yard. And again, it's just a light touch, but just for those people who aren't familiar with it, just you get the essence of what this site is about. So here we have the dry dock or the gauging dock, I think is the actual correct term for it. And this is one of the earliest buildings. And this is really, really reflective of how Ellesmere Yard is not a pastiche, it's a living site, it operates, we work in it. And the dry dock here is a very busy dry dock. We have lots of um, people, private boat owners coming in and restoring and maintaining their boats within the yard, within the dry dock. And also this provides us with a great opportunity potentially to provide training going forward in the future to teach people how to maintain historic boats. It's not necessarily about the boat building, but it is about that maintenance um, as we go forward and making those boats sustainable in their own right. I think this for me is one of my favorite buildings. It's the Lock Gate Shop. And these are photographs that were taken in the 1960s. The, the last lock gates built were in the 19 were in the 1960s and the photograph on the right hand side shows the lock gate the completed lock gate being taken off down the canal if you had the opportunity to go to Ellesmere Yard today and you were to work, walk into that lock gate you could almost identify everything in that photograph as being in that building and that's why it's so special it's still very reflective of how it was used as a place of making in the past and the blacksmith shop is an example again of how we can breathe new life into some of these buildings. The blacksmith shop was um, was was extensively used, was left unused for many years, and fell into disrepair. With funding secured, that the blacksmith's um, forge was repaired, and we now have Rowan. He's been there for a number of years, running a successful business from that forge. And actually, now to complete that circle, he actually now forges items to be used as re for repairs and maintenance of the canal itself so I think in it's that's really lovely narrative to be able to show what the potential is of the yard and the buildings and then another favorite part of my yard is the pattern room on the left hand side you can see a little doorway and beyond that doorway there's another little room and all of these patterns were originally stored in a real jumble in that building because that's how they'd been used. They were pulled out, used, and then thrown back into it. But, and again, this is shows the power of Ellesmere Yard and what the opportunities are going forward in partnership with the National Waterways Museum. We worked with volunteers to archive and list all of those patterns. The now, there are still some in that room. That's, it's all got shelves and, um, and we've extended it into another room and it's all catalogued. And it now means that we can use those patterns in the, in the current maintenance of our canals. And in actual fact, in 2006 and subsequently, when we restored some of the handrails on the Ponkasukta aqueduct, we went back to the original patterns to recast those railings. 
However, there are challenges with this site and these are the challenges that we're very aware of. We do have a program of repairs and the operational team, as Michael alluded before, have done an absolute sterling job over the last 12 months in reopening up some of these spaces so that we can actually understand the true extent of the work that needs to be done. The trust really cannot keep pace now with the level of investment that's needed, even though we do have an annual program of maintenance with these buildings. And our key priority is to conserve these buildings. So we're now at a point where we're looking to secure external funding to try and address the work that's needed so that we can really manage and conserve the site as it should be. And this comes to the programme of testing that we've done this year, which Ruth will talk about, which has been really successful to show the evidence that we need to those funders that this is site that is needed and wanted and there's a demand for. So Saturn, which is the flyboat, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, was there over the summer. Working with MAP, who bring that creative element to this master planning they think differently they look at spaces differently we did the simple thing of moving saturn from the wharf area into the field and suddenly we had an open space we reopened one of the doorways between the yard and the field and it had a completely different feel it was really quite vibrant that waterfront there's other examples there where we've talked with other craft makers within the vicinity to ask them, would you like to work here? Are these spaces suitable? We've been working with young people because that at the end of the day is where the real legacy will be about engaging people in that space. We've got a lovely photograph there of Tony in action, giving heritage talk. And we now have more people trained up um, and we've got scripts for people to be able to start leading those tours. And we've also been working with much younger people with um, interactive um, um, sort of face-to-face -face interpretation and storytelling, again, telling the story of Ellesmere Yard to a wider audience. And that's the end of my presentation. Hopefully that's given you a flavor of the journey that we've been on to get to where we are today. And obviously the next step will be for Tony to give you that little bit more detail about the heritage of the site. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Nicola. That was, uh, that was really good. And um, your enthusiasm for the site comes through uh, loud and clear, um, which is lovely. Uh, so just sum up for us again, what, what really is it in your opinion, what makes Ellesmere Yard such a special site for you personally? Well, so for me, you know, obviously the Canal River Trust, we have lots of heritage buildings. We have lots of buildings that are graded, you know, grade two star and, and have that sort of national importance. But for me, it's the yard is something really special. I always describe it as that it has a soul. I think you go in and you have an essence that it's living and it's working and the people have been making there for such a long time and it and it breathes that and 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 it's a real it, it, I, and you know you can go upstairs and there's a desk there in in the window that looks out onto the yard and you can pull that desk out the drawer out of the desk and it still has handwritten notes from people that have worked there in the past and you know, that makes it really special. And so we need to conserve that to make sure that that soul is kept there in, the, in those buildings. Yeah, it's, it's a really great place. I mean, we were lucky enough as, uh, uh, with our IWA branch to uh, be able to have, I think, the first guided tour um, of, the, of the yard uh, a few weekends ago. And um, as you say, it's, uh, it, it's full of history and it, it just oozes um character so uh, thank you very much for that um so having heard a little bit about um the, the present and the context uh, of all this from nicola uh, i'm now going to hand over to tony yuri who is going to give us uh, a talk about um the history of the yard so tony over to you okay am i there and uh 
Can you see me is the first question? Yes. Hooray. <laughs> because my, uh, I can't see anything on my screen at all. Uh, Michael, can you see me all right? We can, can all see, we can all see you um, and uh, we're ready to go with your presentation. Okay, as so long as you can see me and I can hear what yeah. I'm saying, because I'd like to just um, a, a brief um, reminder of some local history here, really. The idea of this canal really goes right back to 1791 uh, and the, the final, the Act of Parliament was 1793, which is, you'll remember, if you're a canal enthusiast, that this was the whole um, canal mania time when there were uh, canals proposed all over the country. It's changed its mind a little bit because it was 10 years before it really opened. To begin with, it was a north-south canal running from uh, the, the Mersey down to the Severn. Bits of it got built, but they changed their minds halfway. By the time the canal really opened in, um, in 1805, when Pontesilthi was finished, it really became more important as an east-west running from Wales into Nantwich. Now, it's got significant history really to the Inland Waterways Association as well, because LTC Rolfs, first ever canal trips, first ever the, when he really discovered canals um, was in Cressy from Frankton Junction, which is really just up the canal, not very far away. And then, um, this is 1929, um, and you'll, you'll remember of course the Narrowboat, the book that really caused such a, a, a um, a rumpus really was in the 1940s but uh, his first trip was really Ellesmere to Stoke in 1930 and from then on he was a canal enthusiast in waiting in many ways until he bought Cressy and uh, and turned it into a houseboat. Now we'll come back to that uh, I'm going to go to the screen now I hope um, and going to share screen uh, and I'm hoping now that you're on my um, from the beginning. There we go. Are you on full screen with me? I'd like a bit of um, confirmation. Yeah, uh, all good. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You've seen this uh, aerial view uh, at Nicola's really nice talk. Thank you, Nicola. Um, looking from the other direction. Her first picture was looking down on Beach House on the corner. You can just see the chimneys of that house in the distance. But this is the dock. This is the now used as a dry dock, um, indexing dock. Our gauging dock. All of those words apply and the gauging dock and indexing dock and what I want to talk about a bit because that is a very important historic, historic connection. This was one of the very first buildings on the site. After the, after the offices were built on the corner, this was there by 1807. The, the little tiny cottage you can just see um, at the back of the wooden shed on the right hand side of the picture, that was also um, it, it, to begin with, but the yard wasn't here at all. It was decided that the whole maintenance yard was needed and it was built thereafter. So that 1807 um, building, this is reflects its, its commercial importance really, not, not nowadays, not for docking, but because of what it was for. I'm going to find my pictures and the next one I think should be there. Inside the dock, looking back out at it, looking across to the buildings, which we'll get to in a minute. It's a deep water dock. Really, you know, that's, that's five foot of water in there, which when you think back to the days when it was built, it was all horse-drawn boats. And an empty horse-drawn boat really only draws a foot to 18 inches. So you don't need a dry dock in the same way for docking a boat to do repairs and things. Much easier to yank it out on the bank with a couple of winches. So. What's all this about then? Why in 1807 did they need this enormously deep dock? Well, because it isn't really a dry dock in its initial format. It is um, a, a gauging dock, it's an indexing dock. And the reason for that is to find out how much boats were carrying so that they could be charged the right amount of money. Here is Saturn, you've heard Saturn mentioned, she's the last surviving Shropshire Union boat built in 1906. And she would have come up this canal um, before the traffic all finished really from the Shropshire Union Company's point of view in 1920. A bit of horse-drawn traffic carried on into the 30s, but really this whole canal was very nearly derelict um, when 
back to Rolt when he tried to get up it in the 1940s. Now, Saturn's sitting on the Bostocks in the bottom of the dock, but the thing that I really want you to look at most carefully is on the left-hand side, the wall stretching away. Can you see those two shaded alcoves in the wall? They are the important thing to look at. I'll try my next picture, which is going to be a problem, but bear with me. This is more or less taken from the same angle, looking across the dock, and you can see the alcove in the middle of the picture. The purpose of that alcove was to accommodate a crane. There were two cranes. You can see the other one, the hazy distance there. These are from Edward Wilson's book, which um, the Ellesmere and Langrothan Canal published quite a long time ago now. The important thing with him was that he lived next door. And this photograph, we think, was taken in the 1950s, probably. All those iron weights that you can see there are gauging weights. When a new, brand new narrowboat was built and brought up onto this canal, it was brought into this deep water dock. And these weights, Ellesmere Canal Company weights, Montgomery Canal Company weights, were lowered in four tons at a time. And as the boat went down in the water, it was marked. The water lines were marked at six different places all around the boat. And then another four tons were loaded in, marked again, four tons, four tons, four tons, until you've got 28 tons of boat in, of weight in a boat, and that needs some deep water. Then those marks were transferred onto brass plates, copper plates, which were set in the side of the boats. So from that moment on, any um, toll keeper up and down the canal system could look as the boat went by, could take those measurements and look at the book and say, that boat is carrying 25 tons. I'm going to charge it this much money. This is entirely commercial carrying. Now, we think these weights probably went out of use way back in the, probably when the Shops Union Company stopped working in the 1920s, but they were still here in the 1960s and happily, uh, I think six of these, uh, the last surviving six weights are in the bottom of Saturn now as a bit of ballast to stop her skidding about in the wind. So yes, very, very nice uh, connection here. Looking back across the other side of the yard now from that entrance to the dock, which I, of course, because it was built for, sorry, I should go back there, because it was built for loaded narrowboats to be measured in, it is now deep enough for a motorboat with its, all its weight and engines. And that's what's made it so valuable and keeps it in really good use. Middle of this picture, the big black um, building, is the lock gate making shop. Certainly it was there very early on on the yard. We can see it on the plans, but we think it's been extended outwards and upwards over the years as necessary. We'll have another look in there in a, in a little while. But to the right of the picture, a sort of an addition at the end, a rather tatty addition in brick and stone. Yeah, the roof line carries on, but it just seems to be filling in the gap between what was left of the original building and the side of the canal. Downstairs used as a paint store. Upstairs was a mess room for the men working in the lock gate shop. Right, moving across, if I can find the picture. There we go again. Uh, we're going to look to the left a bit and up a little bit. And that, <laughs> that piece of mock Tudor nonsense in the middle there is another it's part of the architectural hodgepodge of this whole yard, which is a, a delight, but um, a bit of an architectural nightmare because this is a fill in. It's a fill in between the lock gate shop on our right mm -hmm. and the, um, the older uh, blacksmith shop and the joiner shop above it, which is to our left, which I'll show in a bit more detail in the middle. But up there, that's the pattern shop. Nicola was talking about the patterns. These are wooden patterns, beautifully crafted pieces of craftsmanship, wooden patterns for making iron castings. We didn't do it, but we don't think anyway, any iron foundry on this yard because it didn't need it because the Bridgewater foundry was just half a mile less than that down the canal arm in Ellesmere. That was taken over by Clays. But the patterns for all the individual pieces of canal architecture and canal engineering had to be made in wood first and very, very accurately with a, uh, an allowance for the shrinkage that was going to happen when the castings were made. An extraordinary trade. And we think 
that they were probably made on site upstairs. But the collection that's there now is just remarkable in its, in, in its comprehensiveness, really. Now, we're looking into the corner of the yard. Downstairs is the blacksmith shop. And again, going back to the old maps, we know that was there um, right from the beginning when the yard was developed. It's tucked right into the hillside. Upstairs is the joiner's shop. You can see the steps going up on the right of the picture to get upstairs under the pattern uh, store and then up into the, the top workshop, which again looks as if it has been extended and used as necessary. Development has just happened almost organically over 200 years. The window sticking out right in the middle there is important. That's where the foreman's desk was. So he could keep an eye on the whole yard and shout at people and make sure that everybody was at work. And that that alcove now, that um, uh, window, still has the desk in that um, Nicola was mentioning with paperwork that dates back to the 1890s. Notebooks made by the men that worked there back in the 1890s. An extraordinary collection. Downstairs, the blacksmith's shop. You had a quick look in there on Nicola's presentation, still in very good condition now and in use. One thing to point out here, right at the left of the picture though, there's um, a rather tatty roof and that is where the engine house was. Steam engine put in in the 1890s, so for the first 80 years of its life the whole place was hand drawing as it were, and then steam engine tucked in the corner there, boiler put in the warehouse next door on a chimney, and a lot of steam plant running there until the 1940s. Let's find another picture. Here's inside the blacksmith shop very shortly after it was made uh, usable again, before um, uh, Rowan, uh, who is working in there now, has gone in and filled it up with all sorts of equipment. But a lovely space cut deep into the hole and uh, into the, uh, the hill behind. And so um, the wall you're looking at there with all the tools behind it is virtually underground. Two blacksmiths working here in the in the glory days, um, two strikers, you know, assistants with him. So there's four men banging away in here. Um, and, you know, the whole place was hard. The yard. Yeah, it's it, it's difficult to envisage now. But um, when it was in full use, um, you know, there were 80 or 90 men working from this yard in the 1880s. Carpenters, but pattern makers, of course, I've mentioned joiners. Bear in mind that that workshop upstairs was not just doing boat repair work, but of course was re restoring, maintaining all the houses that belong to the canal company, the lock keepers' huts, um, houses, and um, any equipment. On the floor of this workshop, now you can just see it at the bottom of the picture, is a tiring plate. A big circular iron plate, which means that they're obviously tired wooden wheels in here, as well as part of the general maintenance of all the equipment. It, you know, they, it's a, a marvellous survivor. Uh, of course, the canal horses were shod in here too. Um, this, the canal company had their own maintenance boats, of course, a whole fleet, but of course, a whole fleet of maintenance boats, which were pulled around by horses because there were no motorboats up on this canal at all, as far as we can judge, not proper narrow boat motorboats until long after the war. Prior to that, it's a horse-drawn canal. And in fact, rather surprisingly, they, this company kept um, a, a boatman working with his own horse, one of the company boats with his own horse until 1957, Jack Roberts. And if you haven't heard of him, you ought to, because he's wrote a most wonderful autobiography, which is now available in terms of the history of canal carrying with horses on the Shops Union system. It is essential reading. Right, I'm going to, I'm going to turn around now to the right and uh, go back into the lock gate making shop. You saw it in use um, previous with the men. This is as it is now, an extraordinarily um, wonderful building. We think, we think it's all to be done, but the, the back wall on the left there is probably the original, but we think it's been extended upwards when that uh, mobile crane was installed. Now that is a hand-drawn crane, hand-operated crane. There's no power 
as far as this. All the power, the steam power, was running with belts into the blacksmith shop and into the joiner's shop upstairs. But for some reason, um, where we're standing now, this is where the power um, drives, the line shafting finished. This crane is operated by these chains. To the right of the picture, hanging straight down, you can barely see that it is, it's turning a wheel and that chain moves the whole structure up and down the workshop, more or less to the middle or just to the left of the middle, you can see that big wheel at the top. Well, that's the wheel that runs against the, um, the crane effectively along the rails to anywhere in the workshop. Four tonne capacity when it was built, it's re been reduced now, but it is still there, it is still operable, and it is still absolutely marvellous. When we started, I said there was a mess room upstairs. You remember I was looking across the yard? Well, there's the staircase at the back of this um, workshop running up to the top door into the staff mess room. Just an amazing place altogether. I'll come back to the beginning now. I'm going to go out of the slides and uh, just a, a, one or two remarks. So how do I get rid of the... Uh, Michael, I could do with your help now, I think, to get myself back on screen. If you just uh, stop your screen sharing, Tony. I stop um, share. Yep, done that. Yep. And there we are. All right. Good. And I'm back in view, am I? Yep, you are. OK, um, we're talking really the reason for this uh, event is thinking about the future of the yard. Now, things have been mentioned of the changes that might have to happen, but of course, at the moment, and being the um, hmm, being the trelly sort of historian that I am, I'm so keen on the interrelationship of all these buildings in the yard. It's functional architecture which has developed and uh, evolved really to suit the jobs that were needed for the maintenance of the canal. It's important, I think, to regional canal history. I mean, as mentioned by Nicola to begin with, it is the only surviving complete maintenance yard and the canal maintenance business was tremendously important but before you even get to carrying the cargoes, which is what, really what interests me. It's important to our local history, and I speak, say, our now because I live elsewhere, I'm proud to do so. Local history and employment and all the, the, uh, the men that worked here. And of course, the the ingredients that are left here, the, the tools, a lot of tools, a lot of machinery, some of it is still in use, some of it um, more or less museum pieces, um, and <laughs> going back to that desk, yes, the paperwork that's still in the, uh, in the foreman's drawer upstairs, just remarkable. It's the integration of this whole collection. So I'm very nervous, I suppose, about the changes that have got to be made. I'm very keen that the unity of the yard um, remains visible and, and accessible. Thank you, that's what I'll finish with. Thank you, Tony, that was the fascinating presentation. Um, you can probably see a building in the background behind me, that's actually the old stable block where Tony referred to the uh, canal company's horses, um, which the blacksmith was uh, busy shoeing. Um, so that was the old stable block and is now currently the, uh, the CRT working offices. Um, and another thing, Tony, I found quite interesting during our visit was that um, we didn't see it on any of your pictures, unfortunately, but the whole site is uh, interconnected by uh, little tramways, um, which uh, appear to run under the current uh, asphalt car park, um, but do emerge at certain places like that door uh, that you pointed out to the um, to the lock gate manufacturing um, workshop. Uh, and that, that was all very interesting uh, to, to, to see and uh, how they shifted all this equipment in and around the yard. So um, that was very good. Thank you. Okay, so now, as Tony has uh, alluded, what about the future? Now I'm going to uh, ask Ruth Essex uh, to give us some uh, observations as to how she's been getting on. Thank you, uh, Ruth. 
Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm not sure I can answer the question in full, uh, what the future, what, what lies for the future, but um, I'll just talk a little bit about the most recent work we've been doing. We've been lucky enough to work at the yards with CRT, um, with, with members of the community like Tony, um, very much supporting us. So we're really grateful for um, the support that we've been given by people who are so, you know, care so much about the yards. And I agree with Tony, it, there's, there's a real nervousness. It's about treating the yard, its spaces, the artifacts within it very gently um, and, and, and sensitively because it's it's carrying so much history within it. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Um, okay. Okay, great. Um, I'm actually gonna um, be as quickly as I can because a lot of what I was going to say was covered by Nicola earlier. So um, I've been working, um, this uh, at Ellesmere Yard for the past two years with a small team of people from an organization called MAP. We've worked with CRT um, for about 10 years now on sites across the UK, sites that are deemed sort of difficult or uncertain in terms of their future. This is just the slide of some of the work that we've done in the past, um, trying to re bring, bring back to life um, this is, this is Warwick Bar in Digbeth and Birmingham, um, working with people locally to enable them to come into the sites and start using them in new and different ways. Um, so we, we take an approach called slow architecture, which Nicola briefly mentioned. Um, it's, it's very much about gradual um, incremental development of sites, um, testing ideas, um, collaborating. And, and not not and, and sort of evolving a vision rather than um, sitting you know a paper exercise where we come up with what we'd like the site to be in the future and then plonking that on. Um, it's very much about um, what was now termed co-production, but it's essentially working together with people um, as equally as possible. Uh, so so we've been working with staff across CRT from different teams, estates, conservation, um, ecology, uh, planning officers, um, and then also um, bringing them together with different people um, who are coming along from different organizations locally or individuals who just have a real interest in um, sharing their ideas or getting involved in some of our activities. So it's about, we've been trying to create as many ways as possible for people to connect with this project. Um, so it's been very much about understanding the context and what we could say building on local assets. So trying to work with what we've got, trying to work with the character of the place of Ellesmere and its surrounding community. Um, who are the people that are there? What are the ideas that they've got? Maybe what, what businesses exist? Um, who would like to come and be involved in the yard um, and then building on that rather than focusing on what isn't there. Um, and in terms of uh, looking at it, it's, it's obviously seen as an asset by CRT. We're trying to find um, flexible ways that people can come in to the space, come into the buildings. Um, it, the, the buildings also have um, about five acres that, that CRT own next to the building, so there's land as well, um, and, and develop flexible tenancies so people can start using um, some of these spaces that um, are no longer needed for operational uses. So these, these are our project phases. We are kind of in the middle now where we, we've done a lot of research and development. Um, we've held events, we've held um, meetings on site. We've, held, we've tried to make them interesting. We've, we've based them around activities and learning. Um, and we're, we've, we've been slowed down obviously by the pandemic, but we're kind of in the stage in the middle is prototyping and transitioning, which means 
we're starting to look at serious suggestions for how we can um, sort of take the yard into the future with um, maybe a, commun a new community of users that will complement the operational uses that they're, are there already and um, will continue. Um, that's, that's the actual site. Uh, ignore there's that that um, design there shows a, a previous design to to build on one of the fields next door to the yard that Tony's shown you around, but that gives you an idea of the land that adjoins the yard that's all owned by um, Canal River Trust. So we've we've held you know uh, events and conversations in the town, um, met all sorts of people. We've sort of assessed what are what people have, have been suggesting and um, there's a definite sense that people don't want it to turn into some sort of commercial unit you know with its history and its previous uses sort of washed out um, people want more access to the yard um, it's been relatively hard for the public to access up until now because it's it's a working yard um, but the trust has held off open days over the last five to ten years that have been very popular so we're thinking about how we can create more public access uh, link it to the town better so people feel like it's part of the town they really know it um, without um, impacting on the, the space that the operational team needs to run it as an operational yard um, we've also looked at the land we've we've the the land of course at the moment it's it's relatively um, usable for, for, for the public. It's lightly grazed by a local farmer. So there's sorts of, all sorts of ideas that have come up around the land. There's us with all our masks on. Um, uh, we've looked at mushroom growing and all sorts of things. <laughs> that was my terrible diagram of how I tried to work out how we could turn the land into a mushroom farm. So we're really thinking of all sorts of ideas here. Um, so we, we'd like the land really to complement the, the site. Um, and, and, that's, and there's something about what we haven't talked about, how the approach to the yards is quite stunning as well, because you kind of, you're hit by the, the side of the buildings, but you've got these wonderful fields next to the canal as well. So we're thinking about how we can create something of interest so people approach the town of Ellesmere and and are drawn to the to, to the land and the buildings that they they see as they approach the the town um so things that we've discovered really is the importance of connectivity there's a problem with the connectivity of the yard to the land it was deliberately built to be inaccessible um which is the beauty as well um and we're very um aware of that as being a the sort of character and quality of it it's it's impossible to access across the canal there's there's no bridge link and it's it sort of looks in on itself um it, it wasn't built as a as a publicly open space but and that's a challenge when we're we're now thinking of the future and how people will maybe connect with this connect with the buildings and and the um the spaces there um i suppose the other thing that is, is very clear from talking to people locally is how important they think is that it continues in its operational capacity. Um, it's not somewhere that people would like to see kind of essentially turned into a tourist attraction with a big cafe and gift shop. I think people are very proud that it's still got that rough and ready feel of somewhere that's doing its job. And, and we, we want to respect that. Um, so, so we've been trying to raise the profile of the yard. We've we've created some visual materials. We've got a logo. We've been connecting to people through social media, through Facebook, um, really trying to communicate better um, about that. We have a newsletter. Um, we've, as Nicola said, we've been talking to the local councils, building up good relationships, um, getting the yards. Or, were more clearly represented in local plans and place plans. Um, and we ran all sorts of activities out of here, which we covered earlier, really. Um, there's Saturn again. Um, 
located along the, the field but, and it framed that that space really really brilliantly having sat in there that's cracker the flat pack horse that the team used to demonstrate the uh the brilliance of the the canal horse the um so that's cracker um here's some pictures of some of our activities so as nicola said we have been training up tony's been helping us train up people and share his knowledge so we can build up a team of people and hold in the future regular slots where people can book and come and have walking tours of the site so um just to say uh, we'd love to see you if you want to come along you know next year we will be opening up the yard more regularly to visitors to come and do walking history tours of the space um we've worked with an ecologist we've worked with um local food growers to start looking at how we can um, basically turn the, the fields alongside the, the yard into a more, more biodiverse, ecology, ecologically rich areas um, and involve people, open it up to food growing, community use. Um, we also um, built a bridge, a very tenuous bridge there. Um, across the across the canal um there's some idea that in the future a, a bridge would be of great use as a pedestrian and cyclist link from the town to the to the yard so we work with um a fantastic team called the paddle brothers who are have got more energy than any of us put together who work with um local kids to build a bridge they did it in a day and they were also took a trip down the canal on paddle boards um, and very much loved it. And what was lovely about that was the, the collaboration we created with this outdoor sort of adventures and the Saturn team who, who also um, talked to the, to the, the kids involved um, about the history. So when they got on the canal and stood on their boards, I heard them talking about what they'd heard earlier. You know, they had a completely different appreciation for what that canal meant um, to, to where they live and, and providing them with that, you know, that leisure use going down the water. Um, we're also been looking at um, creating digital tours. They, they will never um, be as good as a, a tour by Tony, but, um, you know, on, on the webinar, but um, we are looking at trying to um, create 360 degree tours. So people at home who can't come in to the to the site um, can just explore at the leisure um, the site and really zoom in and see what's there. Um, moving forward, I mean, we've covered some of this. We we want to continue with our heritage work and education work. We'll have a um, regular program of tours. We've been documenting the site with film. Um, and photography capturing everything we can um we've developed good relationships with the local schools um something interesting that we're hoping to explore next year is we work with the local secondary school and who will um work with um potentially the satin team when they're doing bo uh, boat renovations next summer in the dry dock and create some sort of skills and training program for the local kids, local teenagers to come and learn a bit about boat maintenance, traditional boat maintenance. Um, we'd like to continue um, developing the land as a community garden and space where people feel like they can come and enjoy and sit by the canal. Uh, we um, will be planting a, a small orchard this winter, which may grow. Uh, subject to demand but we'll definitely be growing and planting some fruit trees uh, this winter um, we'll be doing some work uh, to protect the wildlife particularly looking at that canal edge the, the, between the water and the land um, and we'll also be looking at um, starting some flexible tenancies some of the spaces now that are cleared um, within the yard We'd like to invite, um, there's some people have expressed an interest in coming to try and use some of those spaces. And we're going to look at some complementary users who could come in 
who will be in the area of sort of making crafts, um, you know, small scale manufacture that's in, in keeping with the historic uses of the yard really. Um, and we will be hopefully um, getting them into the site next year to start, um, you know, start running their businesses from in there on a trial basis. Um, so thanks for listening. Um, that's our email, ellesmereyard at gmail.com. Please get in touch if you you know, want, want to share anything or want any more information. We've got a newsletter we can sign you up to, just contact us. Um, and if you are on social media, look us up, Yard on Facebook. Um, and come and visit, more importantly, come, come and see the yard. Um, you know, we'd love to, to have more guests. So that's me done, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, let's uh, reveal ourselves to the audience, as it were. Um, so here we all are. Um, that was uh, very informative, thank you. Um, we still have uh, a little bit of time left to deal with a few questions. Um, and uh, Jim, what have you got for us? Um, I've got a, a couple of questions um, from um, <clears throat> Peter Brown. Um, one, I think, is just uh, uh, Ruth seemed to have answered. I would like to bring a small group of about 20 people next June. Whom should I contact? I would assume that would be June through that email address, which is just put on the screen. Is that correct, June? Uh, Ruth, you're still on mute. Sorry. That, yeah, that is Ruth. I'll... Um... I'll put it on chat as well, the email. So Perfect. if people Thank want you. to contact uh, Peter's other um, question was, uh, what continuing presence does CRT plan to have uh, about how many uh, staff and, uh, and doing what? So I take it, Nicola, could you answer that please? Um, well, uh, hello, Peter. I assume it's Peter Brown that I know. So <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the intention is that it will remain as an operational site as it is at the moment and all the activity that we're doing and the work that we're doing with MAP is about finding complementary activities that will um, fit in with that operational use and it will remain as an operational yard as it is at the moment. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Uh, thank you then for that one, uh, Nicola. Um, I've just got one more question from Bob Dewey, is that uh, one of the joys is that Yard is doing what it is designed to do. Um, it wasn't designed to grow mushrooms. Uh, there is a danger it will end up being something quite different. How will this be controlled? Ruth, for you? Uh, we, we weren't talking about growing mushrooms in the yard, although there are a few on the walls. Um, it, <laughs> So, um, but but yeah, we, we were talking about the um, the fields next door to the yard. There's, like I said, there's about five to six acres. Um, so it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a separate space. Um, so, but, so yeah, the, yeah so, so there will be some control of what's happening on the fields. They're not going to put uh, 20 houses or, or um, uh, uh, shepherd's huts or things like that. Uh, you know, it's going to be in a controlled manner. Yeah, I, I, uh, well, anything that we, you know, we, we, we're pretty sensitive about what can happen and then I think, I think that's there's planning, well. there's planners and an English heritage to keep us in control. <laughs> control. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll grow small Thank mushrooms, you. if anything, it'll be <laughs> tiny. Uh, uh, there's another one just come through. Um, from Ian Israel, could some uh, of the space be used for a men's shed i th i think oh. what he probably means is men in sheds yeah. um, <laughs> which is uh which is a sort of um uh I don't know, men in sure it's men in a shed it's <laughs> men in sheds like doing jobs yeah yeah you, um, you, I mean, no, for, it's, for, it's, for example um we we've had them um 
uh, prepare um, picnic tables for um, uh, canal side uh, facilities and things like that in other parts of the country. I assume that's what uh, Ian is is asking about. It's a great it's a great suggestion, and we've we've been in touch with a local group. There is a there is a men in sheds group in Ellesmere, so. Um, yeah, we're in conversation. Lovely. Yeah. Okay. Um, Anne Hazar is just asking, would any of the ideas from the Black Country Museum be useful? Obviously, they've got a canal side uh, operation there. I mean, it's one of my favourite places in the world, actually, the Black Country Museum. It's a fantastic um, place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you think, Nicola or Tony? Yeah, yeah. I think, I, well, I'll let Tony speak in a minute. I think from the, I think what, I, I, I don't, I'm sure it's not meant in this context, but I think for us it's we, one of the very early ideas for the yard was that, um, was that it should be a museum, but actually that's something we really don't want. We want it to be um, a living, but in, in its essence now and have those craft makers coming in now and making things. So I think there's certainly principles that we could take, but we do want it to be, we don't want it to be a museum. We're very keen to have it as a, an operational site with people making and doing and within that context. I don't know if you've got any think, comment, Tony. Oh, sorry, go on, Ruth. I mean, one of the things really is how we protect the artifacts and protect yeah. the character of the spaces. Because, And so that's, that's the big challenge. Um, but that's the thing that I'm sort of most concerned about. Is, is all the little things that we've mentioned, you know, the bits of paper and the drawers full of stuff, people's, people's stuff. Um, so yeah, it's how you do that and keep something that's an active, you know, what, what someone described it as actually, a, a local person who came to, to, to one of our events was it's living culture. So it's, it is, it is it's, it's, it goes beyond a, a living museum. It's, it's actually sort mm. of, the culture of that work is still happening around you. So, Tony? Yes, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in that dichotomy mentally, as it were. I like museums. I like the Black Country Museum, particularly with the thoroughness with which it's been done and the events that they run there. It's a different situation there. I'm also aware of the problems of maintaining a, a, a site like this and the buildings and everything. So I don't have an answer. I just have questions at the moment and um, hope that we can come up with a, a satisfactory answer. Um, no, it is a dichotomy. Museum or working yard, they're not the same thing. Um, uh, and, you know, I want, I want it to be an educational resource. That means people coming in. That means organising spaces so that people can come in safely and on and on and on and all the problems of uh, a public space to be discussed, of course. Um, but I'm very keen that what is there now, the historic uh, material that's there now is respected in situ, you know, taken away. We did have a visitor recently looking from the museum's um, department and he looked at that collection of patterns, mm -hmm. the wooden patterns up in the, up in the attic. And he said, yes, they are very nice, he said, but of course they're not particularly special historic enough to um, put into a, a, a national museum somewhere else they're not that special and I'm thinking no we're not saying it's that special they're very very special to Ellesmere to the waterways to that yard and that store and that's the there's a whole tangle of interconnectedness about these spaces at the yard which is um, quite subtle but very important Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we've covered the uh, the few um, questions which which have been asked. Yeah. Um, we've slightly overrun our target of uh, an hour. Um, there are a couple more questions come through, Mike, but we'll have to be done offline. Um, well, if they're easily answered, um, you know, I, I can give it another five minutes or so, but I... I can understand that people perhaps want to get on with the rest of their evenings. <laughs> uh, um, it's just one uh, come from Bernie Jones. Could the yard be used? And I think Tony will appreciate this one. Could the yard be used to provide apprenticeships for canal boat design and building? Ooh. 
uh, well, I, I, well I, Tony can come in with maybe on this, but we we actually one of the things that we have done it through this is worked. Um, we had a webinar with the National Historic Ships, and one of the things that we'd like to be able to do is look at where we might be able to run training programs, particularly around the dry dock because it's such a unique facility there. Not necessarily around boat building because the yard was never designed for boat building. We don't have the, you know, the space, the facility really for boat building. Um, and again, going back to this, we've got to marry it up with our operations that are in that, that site. Um, but there, there is the, part of that webinar was that discussion around that um, training and skills about maintenance of historic boats and how you maintain them and keep them floating and what are the skills that are required to, to, to repair and, 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 and say carry on that maintenance. So yes, there is certainly training is certainly something we want to look at, not boat building, because I don't think that's appropriate for Ellesmere Yard, but certainly around keeping boats afloat and the skills that you need to maintain those historic boats. I don't know, Tony, if you want to come in on that, but that's, that's um, certainly what we discussed with Nas National Historic Ships at that webinar. Yes, I'm, I'm in agreement with you, really. The yard wasn't designed to build boats, certainly maintaining boats. It always has done, but especially the work boats rather than the carrying boats. Um, but yeah, no, I have nothing useful to add, but um, I'm with you on that. Yeah. OK, fine. I see the, the last uh, comment from um, Malcolm Tucker was uh, was more of an observation um, mm. than, than a question. Uh, pointing right. out that uh, we're a bit tight on space at the uh, in the yard and so that is obviously going to be a constraint um, on, on what uses what alternative uses can be uh, can be achieved yeah there's one come through on chat um, Mike from Alan Gifford of uh, how is the yard presently financed uh, it, it just sits under the West Midlands regional um, operational budgets so it's currently financed by the canal and river trust within the west midlands region and this is why um and the the repairs the ongoing pro the program that i was talking about um originally um at the initial part of my presentation those repairs are financed by our national sort of property team so there's a little bit of mixture so the operations is very much falls under the West Midlands region, the repairs that we're doing to the building sits within our national property team. So, so it's a number of different packages, but it's essentially all Canal and River Trust. Okay. Right. I think that probably is now time to wrap things up. So um, I'd like to thank very much our three presenters, uh, Nicola, Tony and Ruth. I'd like to thank Jim for uh, keeping an eye on two different areas where questions could come from. And most of all, I'd like to thank you, the audience, uh, for joining us this evening. So I hope you found it all interesting and I hope you uh, found it enjoyable. Uh, perhaps at some stage in the future, we'll be able to do something like this again and have an update um, and uh, find out how uh, Ruth and Nicola and their colleagues have got on. So uh, once again, thank you very much. Have a good evening. And um, I suppose at this time of year, I am allowed to say have a happy Christmas. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye.